For those not able to afford the time or high price tag associated with an Orient Express, QE2 and Concorde New York tour, there were always less costly and time-consuming alternatives available. Run by the pioneers of Concorde charter travel, a day trip through the Garden of England to Canterbury by the Orient Express, pulled by a steam engine, and returning on Concorde to the nearby Manston airfield proved a popular alternative. Manston's particularly interesting because we usually come in off the North Sea. We've taken off, gone up and done a loop around the North Sea, come back past North Foreland Lighthouse. And um, then approaching Manston, it looks very different because it's got a very wide runway. Some runways are shorter than the standard of 46 metres and others are wider. And Manston, being an ex-military airfield, is actually considerably wider, so the perspective looks very different. Ironically, Manston provides a constant reminder that in today's competitive aviation marketplace, aircraft that have outlived their usefulness are unceremoniously put out to grass. With greater scrutiny being placed on commercial viability, regional charters that use up valuable aircraft cycles could well prove to be a thing of the past. Even prior to the accident, BA was privately weighing up the financial returns of such trips, the key objective of preserving the fleet's life as long as possible for the core business route to New York. Ironically, the month of the Paris tragedy also saw some of the busiest regional charter programs in the UK in the aircraft's history. On the 3rd of July, Glasgow played host to a private charter from New York with a group of American golfers visiting Scotland for a week-long tour. With the evening backdrop of the hills around Loch Lomond as Concord prepares to return empty to London, many BA staff in Glasgow were already asking themselves whether their airline's flagship would ever return north of the border. A week later, Concorde was out on another UK regional tour, this time to the Midlands and North West. Well, there's no question Concorde is an aircraft which turns heads, turns the heads of people who have no need to fly on it. It's just almost a question of being part of a country which was capable of putting such a beautiful aircraft into the air. Even on the very short one and a half hour round the bay flights, we used to get all the passengers up during the course of the flight for a quick peek at the flight deck. And just to look at their faces and the sort of wonderment on their faces was, was tremendously rewarding.
people who had always wanted to do it who now found themselves terminally ill. The group of people who'd had the same milkman for years and years and clubbed together to give him a ride with his wife. You can go on and on with people for whom it was really something very, very special. absolutely remarkable. I mean, there's this airplane traveling faster than the rifle bullet on the edges of space, 23 miles a minute or something it's going at when it's uh, going at top speed. And it feels as though you're hanging suspended in space. The only thing that tells you that you're moving is that occasionally when you're flying over the subsonic airplanes, you can see all these 747s 20,000 feet below you, almost appearing to go backwards. I mean, you are going 800 miles an hour or thereabouts faster than they are. The airplane was an absolute delight to fly. It handled beautifully. And remember, we're talking about an airplane that was being designed in the late 1950s, mid 1960s. I think it's absolutely amazing. And here we are now in the 21st century, and it remains unique. After pulling in the crowds at Birmingham and Manchester, the aircraft's busy summer schedule turns to the southwest as another BA Concorde prepares to drop in and an air of anticipation builds amongst the spectators. With the airport laying on extra car parking in nearby fields and donating the proceeds to charity, it was clear that after 30 years in the air, this symbol of Anglo-French pride still turned heads. When you're watching Concord's approach, everybody's out there, they find a, a reason that they must be out on duty on that day, and uh, you're, everybody's straining to try and see it, the first landing light coming from the distance, and we're lucky because we have such a clear view, it's unrestricted, unlike some of the major airports where it probably gets lost with a lot of buildings and other things. From here, you can see it, and you start to build up the adrenaline, and the excitement is phenomenal. It's quiet, and then all of a sudden, the roar of Concorde, the adrenaline is bursting. It's amazing the, the amount of emotion it can it give people. It reminds me of a period early in my career when I was on the Viscount and we used to fly around the Scottish Islands and down to the Channel Islands and lots of other little airfields. And I think when you go to those places, it just gives you a feeling really of roots of serving communities. And certainly the flying is interesting, landing on the shorter runways and negotiating the tighter taxiways and crowds of people there pressed up against the fence. and. Just the enthusiasm of the staff on the ground is another thing that really struck you. With the pilots obviously enjoying themselves, raising and lowering the long droop nose in front of an adoring audience, this weekend provided an extra bonus. Concorde was to be outstationed for the whole two days. Our normal operation would see uh, flights to the Balearics, Canaries, uh, Greece, Cyprus, and we do have a transatlantic flight to Canada, but it's not the same as Concorde. That has something so different. People talk about it forever after Concorde. 
It just means so much. The same weekend, the airport was renamed Exeter International, with Concord as the star guest of the show. But although both local press and public were out in force to mark the occasion, as ever, it was Concord's presence that made the local headlines. The following day, even bigger queues had developed to try and catch a ride on the star attraction. And people will even turn up for a last minute opportunity with a fistful of money uh, because they're so desperate to get on Concord when of course it's full and they've missed it. But they'll have to queue up for the next year. But as soon as Concord's been here, they're already looking at uh, next year and so on because they know that they've got an anniversary or a birthday or something or other they want to celebrate. So they're all so keen and once they've seen it at Exeter, it means so much more whether it's coming in or going out. It has a, a thrill for everybody to say, well, I've been on there, I've been on Concord. To them, it's only up the road that it was built. So many people who've travelled to see it uh, have worked on it. In the past, we have a lot of people who were engineers or they did something with regard to the uh, start-up of Concord. And so they have a, a, an allegiance towards it and just love to watch it come in. And they've always got a story to tell when they worked on it. And so they feel it's very much part of the West Country, although we're at the South West. It's still the West Country, and it's our aeroplane, really. For the crews, charters represent something out of the ordinary, and it's this sense of adventure that proves attractive. However, the window of opportunity for new pilots to sign up to this exclusive club comes up rarely. I think generally they're real enthusiasts. There are a number of reasons for this, partly because of the limited route structure in everyday life, partly because uh, they have to stay on the aircraft for a number of years, so their career opportunities may be curtailed in the meantime. And I think it's pretty true to say that all the time I've been on the aircraft, all the people who've come on it or wanted to come on it have been very, very keen to do so. They're not put off by the fact that probably three-quarters of their trips will be to New York. They just want to get on the aircraft. There we were, ordinary pilots flying, having the luck to fly such an extraordinary aircraft, such an interesting aircraft, such a historic aircraft, at the same time as being way ahead of its time, in its time, quite extraordinary. It's an aeroplane that captures the imagination and the heart of any pilot or flight engineer. But there's also that great feeling that you're amongst a small group of people by necessity because we don't need that many crews. It's rather like playing regularly in a sports team. You build up a good feeling of camaraderie and uh, some general interest and enthusiasm. I think the hardest thing is that every sense is assailed by flying this aeroplane. I think that, that what, we weren't, what the simulator can't prepare you for is the noise, the acceleration, the, 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 the fact that absolutely every sense is overloaded. It's a wonderful machine and it's very difficult not to sound trite. It's a superlative aeroplane, and the only words you can use to describe it as superlatives, really. It's not just enthusiasm, it's passion. The passion that the flight crew have for flying this beautiful aircraft. We love taking her across the Atlantic, doing what she was designed to do, flying business people faster than the Earth rotates. Arriving in New York, which has become a second home. Most of us do our city living there. Some sail, some go to the theatre, many have friends. A real opportunity to get away from it all. But in the winter when it's cold there, we really value flying Concorde on the other scheduled route to Barbados. To New York, we see the same faces day in and day out. 80% of them are business people, 80% are repeat customers. 
We often see the same faces together with their families going down to Barbados for that wonderful winter holiday. But also other folks have saved up all of their earnings to have that very special once-in-a-lifetime break on this beautiful island in the Caribbean. The flight crew love it, the cabin crew love it. We get away from the winter to the glorious summer sun. After the onboard haute cuisine, passengers wait for the opportunity to visit the flight deck, a practice now sadly curtailed since the events of September the 11th. Flying at Mark II, as the aircraft heads south towards the tropics and the air warms at lower altitude, so the reverse happens in the stratosphere, assisting Concorde to increase her rate of climb. Shortly before the descent into Barbados, Concorde levels off at 60,000 feet, her maximum altitude, as John Tai dials up the initial descent level. Behind the pilots, flight engineer Ian Kirby monitors the fuel situation, crucial for balancing the weight of the aircraft prior to landing. After lowering the visor and selecting the nose to its initial landing position during the descent, Concorde passes over the northeast coast of the island. Shortly, she turns south along the west coast, 1,500 feet above the Caribbean Sea, passing the chain of luxury hotels scattered along its popular sandy beaches. Concorde 273 is clear to land on QNH 1016 millibars. The surface wind is 085 at 1 2 knots. Let's go by Concorde 273, we're clear to land on runway 09. At the island's Grantley Adams International Airport, the returning passengers, many of whom have flown out subsonic on the jumbo, are looking forward to their journey home on Concorde as they check in. As two of the three flight deck crew check in, today's captain, Roger Mills, is busy checking load sheets and passenger lists in the BA office prior to the 4,000 mile return to London. Outside, it's all actions as the catering is loaded at the front end and the local BA ground engineers give the aircraft the routine once over. While seemingly every possible member of BA ground staff swarm around the aircraft like bees at a honeypot, at the back, the passenger's baggage is being loaded into the hold. Concorde operates at the very limit of her range between Barbados and London, so fuel tanks are fully topped up before departure to reduce the need for a fuel stop. Meanwhile, the cabin crew board to ensure that everything is neat and tidy for the passengers. On the ground, loading the passengers is not a quick and easy affair, as everybody seems to want to take that souvenir photograph on the tarmac before they take their seats. Speedbird Concorde 272, runway New 09, QNH 1015 millibars, temperature 30, the wind is 090 degrees, 10 knots at the time 27. Roger 1015, back away the cockpit, Speedbird 272, just starting engines now. On the flight deck, Captain Roger Mills on the left and Senior First Officer Dave Bias make final preparations for the flight back to London. Departure is from the easterly runway up towards Barbados's southeast coastline. Concorde 272 is now cleared for takeoff. The wind is 090 degrees, 10 knots. There we go, Concorde 272. 3, 2, 1. V1. Rotate. V2. Positive climb. After a couple of hours of sustained supersonic flying, Concorde continues to head along its special supersonic track, heading northeastwards past the Azores.
As he looks out of the cockpit window, Captain Roger Mills was well aware that the sun would soon be setting on his conquered career. In New York in October 2002, the local BA crew had prepared a send-off for Captain Les Scott, affectionately known as the Silver Fox, prior to his last ever Concorde flight to London. As the passengers were largely oblivious to this symbolic moment, Captain Scott's family were the last to board the aircraft to accompany him on his last emotional trip home. As appropriately, the unofficial flagship of the flagships, aircraft GBOAC, pushes back, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey had laid on its own tribute to this popular senior training captain, who'd been responsible for training his own co-pilot, Les Evans. In a considered moment, Captain Scott decided not to subject this Concorde to the effects of a multicoloured fountain, even his last flight. For BA's retiring pilots at the age of 55, leaving the Concorde fleet to the newcomers leads to mixed emotions. I spent 15 years on that aeroplane and I never once drove up to Heathrow feeling that I wished I wasn't doing it. There was always that eager anticipation that I was about to get back into the flight deck of my favourite aeroplane. I mean, I've flown well over 70 different types of aeroplanes, including helicopters and seaplanes and all sorts of things. Um, and there is nothing that compares with Concorde. It comes into a very special category. It's the Grand Prix racing car, the Epsom Derby winner of the flying world, without any doubt at all. I think it was Sir Hugh Casson, the British architect, who described Concord as a piece of 20th century sculpture and I think that describes it very neatly actually and it is in a sense the fusion of art and technology in, in an absolutely sublime way. How did you feel on your last flight when you landed back to Heathrow? Absolutely devastated, awful feeling. Knew it was coming, I mean you know you're going to be retiring um, but um, there you go. When we got out to the aircraft in the morning, it was a lovely New York morning, as only those mornings can be, fresh, lovely bright blue sky, and a smashing flight back, smooth flying conditions, wonderful visibility, and came back to London also on a lovely, clear, calm evening. And I thought, if you've got to finish, that's the way to do it. Quick kick of the tyres when you leave, <laughs> and then the realisation you're not going to do it again. It's a dreadful feeling, that last flight. I really had withdrawal symptoms for, I don't know, a year, 18 months. And eventually I sort of had to pull myself together and say, come on, Hutchinson, there are other things to do um, and another life to be got on with. But, uh, you know, initially for the first year,